Welcome to this video series on emergency preparedness for historical records repositories by the Vermont Historical Records Program. The Vermont Historical Records Program is based at the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration and provides guidance and assistance to organizations with historical records. We can conduct on-site assessments, help connect organizations that want to collaborate on initiatives, and we can teach workshops. This video will be covering how to develop a disaster plan. We will walk through the basic components of a plan and show some examples along the way. A basic disaster plan has five categories. First is the contact list or who needs to be called in when a disaster happens. Next are the response procedures. This is the section that describes where, when, and how you respond to a situation. Then you have your institution salvage priorities. What is the stuff that is crucial to save and must be saved before anything else? You'll want to include an inventory of supplies and their locations to help you implement your response procedures. And finally, you'll want to include an emergency record. This is your why. Why disaster planning is necessary because you have evidence of what's happened before. Now I'm going to go through each of these in more detail and show you some examples from the mock disaster plan of the Hogwarts Library. Contact list is the part of the plan that you see first, and it tells you exactly who to contact and when. If you walk into your building and see something has happened, you can open your plan and know who to call first to get the response efforts going. The contact section can include emergency contacts, such as local fire and police, and lists the staff or volunteers that should be called. This section is a phone tree, which tells you the order in which people should be called or the circumstances in which they should be called, if it's a water emergency versus a theft, for example. An example from the Hogwarts Library disaster plan. First, if there's a fire or injury, call 911. That's your first contact. Then, who is your first person you call af after emergency responders? In this case, Professor McGonagall is the Hogwarts Library disaster team leader, so she would be called first. Then the next person to be called would be dependent upon the type of emergency. Is it flooding or building damage? Hagrid the groundskeeper should be called in those cases. If there's a problem with electrical systems, then they would call their electrician from Lumos Light Technicians. You can see from this example that in some situations, you would call internal staff, and sometimes you would call external service providers. It all depends on who has the responsibility for that which is affected. And oftentimes, disasters are going to affect several things at once. Is there flooding as well as damage to collections? Then you would call the groundskeeper for water issues, as well as the librarian to deal with the collection damage. In any situation, you are calling multiple people to handle different aspects of the damage, both people internal to the institution and external. It's important to note that you must protect lives before property and assess personal safety before acting. That's the first thing that should always be done in an emergency. If there are power lines down in front of your building's entrance, for example, do not go inside to assess the damage. Keep everyone safe above everything else. Place this note first in your plan so that you see it first thing as a reminder in the moment when you need it. While you are creating the contact list, ask yourself some questions. Who on your staff would need to be notified during a disaster? Who would need to be involved in a disaster response? In what order should they be notified? And also look at who has the responsibility for what in your institution. This will help you to determine who needs to be notified during a disaster, who handles the collections, who handles building issues, who handles computer and IT stuff. Do you have utilities, vendors, or external contracts who handle these issues for you? These are the people who need to be contacted during a disaster. And be aware of what local emergency services are available and add them to the contact list. But again, the number for them would be 911 if there was an immediate active emergency, such as a fire or a medical problem. Next, we have the guidelines for how to respond during an incident. These response procedures tell you what to do during an emergency as it's happening. This includes procedures for evacuation and other emergencies, floor plans that include the locations of shutoffs for water and other building systems, information about your insurance and utility providers, technology backups and passwords, contact information for local emergency management offices, and locations of sites that could be used for temporary operations or salvage recovery. This is all the stuff that gets you through the moment and helps set you up for the recovery phase. In our examples, we have a brief description of how an evacuation should proceed. The plan also has established an external assembly area 
and a backup assembly area to gather in after an evacuation. The Hogwarts Library has established an agreement with the manager of Platform 9 and 3 quarters to have a temporary staging area or a command center in case the entire castle is compromised and there's no space available within the Hogwarts campus itself. This could be a place to command operations for cleanup, to spread out and salvage materials if they've been wet or damaged, for example. Platform 9 and 3 quarters is actually a little far away from Hogwarts to be really useful. Ideally, you'd want to have an agreement with someone in your community perhaps a school with a gym or a municipal office building or a civic center, finding a location with a large space to spread out in would be ideal. In the second example, you can see a list of several Vermont contacts that can help in an emergency, including Vermont Emergency Management, the Vermont Arts and Culture Disaster and Resilience Network, or VACDARN, the Secretary of State, and Vermont's regional office with FEMA. This is a place to put the contact information of your local emergency management director and regional planning commission as well. Contact information for your utility providers can be captured here, as well as information about your insurance agents or providers. These are the people who are important for your recovery, but that should be contacted after your key contacts identified in the first section. Here you have an example of floor plans that are labeled with locations of important building systems equipment, such as water tanks, furnaces. It's important to note special circumstances on the floor plans. The restricted section is stored on the second floor of the Hogwarts Library, so it's normally kept locked. That would be important to know in an emergency that you'd need a key to get into that space. There's also a list of locations of fire extinguishers, fire alarm pull boxes, and utility switch-offs. Photos show very clearly where the shutoffs are. All of this information is very important during the chaos of an immediate disaster. Again, this is designed to help you in the moment. You or your emergency responders can quickly look at the floor plan and see where to go, only if it's safe to enter that space, of course. And it shows you what you're looking for to quickly shut off anything that needs to be to stop further damage. You also want to capture response procedures for technology. This would be where you capture necessary passwords and the location of any computer backups that would enable you to access your technology systems, especially if you have to set up computer equipment in a temporary offsite location. Here are some questions to ask yourself as you fill out this section of the plan. What are your procedures for evacuating the building or handling a medical emergency or other type of situation? Where are the locations of shutoffs for building system equipment like water and electrical? Map those locations on a floor plan of your building. Who are the vendors or contractors you use? And who are your insurance and utility providers that would need to be contacted to begin the recovery process of filing damage claims, fixing damage, where do you store your computer backups and what are the passwords to get into your data so you can access your IT? And where in your community could you set up a temporary space for emergency operations and recovery if needed? Start talking to those places right away and agree to it. The Vermont Department of Buildings and General Services has a flip chart of procedures for various emergency situations that you might want to take a look at when developing the section. They go beyond building evacuations and medical emergencies and discuss what to do during all types of scenarios, such as suspicious packages or hazardous spills. There's a lot there, but it's something to consider while working on your own response procedures. Next up in our disaster plan is a list of salvage priorities. This is the stuff that is most important to be saved that needs to be saved first before anything else. It includes operational records, those records you absolutely need to keep doing business, catalogs and other records about your collections that without you wouldn't know what you have. These operational and collections records is your essential stuff. And other salvage priorities might be actual priorities in your holdings, such as particular archival or object collections or rare book or local history collections. It's the stuff that's irreplaceable that you would want to save before anything else. You want to include the locations of these items in your plan by listing the priorities and where they're stored, it's all in one convenient place for that time when it's been deemed safe to enter the building, and you can begin pulling out what needs to be saved first. Here's an example of salvage priorities. In this situation, the Hogwarts Library has some special object collections that would need to be prioritized over general circulating book collections. This is the rare stuff. Library staff have also gone through and marked with colored tags that indicate whether something is high priority or medium priority. For stuff on shelves, you could put reflective tape or color tags. Flagging priorities is going to be incredibly useful when you have many hands going into the space. 
It's a simple system and everyone knows what to look for quickly. The library has also indicated which of their collections records are important to save and their administrative records that they'd need for operations. Each set of records has a description of where in the building they're located and what they look like. Here's another set of questions to ask yourself while creating this section. What administrative records would you absolutely need to continue operating your institution? What catalogs and other bibliographic records do you have about your holdings? And do you have any valuable or irreplaceable materials like a local history or archival collection that would need to be prioritized over materials? And once you know what the salvage priorities are, where are they located? And should you indicate or tag those items somehow to show that they're priority? Determining priorities can take time, but it's essential to being able to bounce back after an emergency. It ensures that you can keep operating, that you have information about your holdings, and that the irreplaceable stuff is protected and preserved. Disasters are messy, and having some essential supplies can help protect you and your space during the cleanup, as well as helping to triage any damage to your collections. You'll want to include in your plan an inventory of the supplies you have, where they're stored, and ideally include stores or other sites where you can get more of those supplies as needed. This is a blank sample that lists types of supplies that are good to have on hand. You'll see personal protective equipment like masks and gloves, collection salvage supplies like boxes and blotter paper, and cleanup equipment like fans, buckets, and mops. Record keeping supplies like paper and cameras are very useful in documenting damage to your building and collections, important for insurance purposes, among other reasons. Record how much you have of each supply and where it's stored. And as mentioned before, you may want to indicate where you can get more supplies, especially if they're not something you can find at a regular store. Keep your inventory updated. You'll want to check the supply cache from time to time and note when it was last checked. Try keeping your supplies together in a bin or a bucket to consolidate things and make it easy to grab in one go when you need it. Something plastic is ideal so that it's water resistant, unlike a regular cardboard box would be. To recap the supply inventory, determine what supplies you already have on hand and where they're stored, and then ask yourself what supplies you want to get and where you can get them. Now we're moving on to the final section of the disaster plan, the record or history of previous emergencies or disasters that your institution has faced. What's happened in the past will tell you what's possible and what might be likely to happen again. This section will require a little research by asking longtime or former employees or volunteers to search through their own memories of past incidents. You want to check the floodplains for your region to see if your institutional building is located on a floodplain because this might indicate previous flooding incidents. If your administrative records have any past insurance claims, you can see what happened to initiate those claims. In our example, the Hogwarts Library briefly describes two past incidents, an attempted break into the restricted section and a haywire raining hex caused by a second year study group that caused water damage to a small section of the collection. You'd probably want your description of past incidents to be more detailed than this example. You want to include what happened, when, what was affected, and what resources were needed for recovery, including money, time, personnel, and any vendors who were involved. And if you can't reconstruct what happened in the past, that's okay. Keep this space for anything that happens in the future. Be sure to write down what happens during any emergencies going forward. So now we've walked through each component of the plan. Together, all the pieces give you the instructions for what to do when the unexpected happens. By going through this process of planning, you'll know who to call, what to prioritize, and what to do when the time comes. And your disaster plan might not look exactly like the example shown here, but that's okay. Your plan is unique to your institution and you need it to work for you and your needs. So there is good news and bad news about disaster planning. The bad news is it does take time and effort, but the good news is you don't have to start from scratch. There are lots of templates out there available for you to use that are a good start. And the following are just the tip of the iceberg. Take a look at them all and see what works best for your institution. All of the examples shown in this video used the Vermont Historical Records Program's basic disaster plan template for Vermont. This template is a Microsoft Word document that you can fill out with your own information and is available at the link on the screen. DPlan is a free online disaster planning tool where you can enter information about your institution into the fill in the blank template. 
The template helps guide you through the steps and once complete, will generate a printable disaster plan specific to your institution. And since disaster plans need to be continually reviewed and updated, DPlan allows you to update the information you've already entered so your plan can be up to date. You don't have to start filling in your information right away. You can actually check out a demo that they've set, out, set up at the website. DPlan was created by the Northeast Document Conservation Center and the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners and should be updated in the spring of 2022. And the Northeast Document Conservation Center created another tool for disaster planning, their planning worksheet. It's designed to help an institution collect information that can then be put into a disaster plan. It contains many, but not all of the disaster plan elements discussed in this video. The worksheet does not have places to include information about evacuation guidelines, locations of facility system shutoffs, or other relevant policies and procedures like that but it is helpful for collecting contact information, supply information, and information about salvage priorities. You might want to use this as a jumping off point and augment it later with more procedures and instructions for what's not included in the worksheet. Pocket Response Plan or PREP, created by the Council of State Archivists, is a portable supplement to your disaster plan. This is a one-sheet, double-sided template that can be filled out with crucial contact information for staff, emergency responders, utilities, vendors, and suppliers on one side, and it has an emergency checklist on the other side that details the actions that should be taken within the first 24 to 72 hours following a disaster. This is specifically designed to be printed and folded in a way that fits in your pocket so it can always be on hand. This is a great way to boil down the essential information of your complete disaster plan into something that you can always have on your person. So that if you walk into your library one morning and find an emergency waiting for you, you'll have the immediate first steps to take in your pocket. Now that your plan has been drafted, you need to make sure it's accessible to your staff and volunteers. Distribute copies to your team members and to all other essential people who have a role to play in the event of a disaster. You'll need to think about where to store the plan. Hard copies are great in different locations, also maybe somewhere in the cloud. The key to having the plan is that it's accessible and that people will be able to get to it when it's needed. If the only copy of the plan is stored on a computer drive that crashes or it's in a three ring binder on a site when the building is on fire, the plan won't do you much good then. Having multiple copies is also key. Remember the old saying, lots of copies keep stuff safe. Have backup copies. Many people keep copies of their disaster plan in their car. Ideally, a printed version is best, so it's not reliant upon electricity and internet if those happen to be out. Another good rule to remember is the 321 rule in digital preservation. Three copies on at least two different kinds of media and one copy stored somewhere different than the other copies. The important thing is uh, it's really important to remember that this plan contains sensitive information about your building and institution, private phone numbers, passwords, floor plans, insurance information. This is information that should not be made public. This is an internal document, not something to be published widely on your website for everyone to see. The details in the plan, if in the wrong hands, could make you vulnerable to theft or vandalism. Just remember to have multiple copies for everyone who needs the plan and keep it away from the eyes of everyone else. Or you can also maintain two different versions, the full plan for only the handful of people who need it and a redacted version that can be shared more widely. There are a few things you should remember and take with you as you start on this process. First, your plan is unique to your institution. Your plan won't look exactly like someone else's and that's okay. Your plan may not exactly follow the templates seen here, and that's also okay. Even the templates don't look exactly alike. What they're meant to be is a tool to guide you through the process of developing your own unique plan that works for your institution. Keep things as simple as possible. Your plan doesn't have to be 50 pages long if you can cover everything you need to in 20. You want the plan to work for you when you need it to. And this goes for all of the other preparedness activities as well. You don't need fancy supplies if you can find stuff for your cash that works around your house or your staff's houses. The more simple you keep things, the more likely that you'll stick with your emergency preparedness efforts and ensure that they work for your needs. Disaster plan writing and emergency preparedness actions in general are iterative. You don't do it once and you're done. 
You have to revisit the plan and make sure it's up to date or it won't be useful. You have to make sure that your supplies are still stocked. Make sure your contact information is current. And it's actually a good thing that you have to continue to revisit the plan because it will continue to reinforce the emergency preparedness skills you have, which then, of course, helps to keep you prepared. And remember that you're not alone in this. You don't have to and shouldn't have to develop this plan on your own. Each institution has a set of people with their own unique skill set that is useful in disaster planning and response. Emergency preparedness by its nature has to be collaborative because it involves so many skill sets and logistical parts. It's all about building connections and relationships with those moving parts and creating a community of emergency preparedness for your institution. And we cover how to create an emergency planning team in another video in this series. Now let's see what you've learned. If you'd like to test your knowledge, you can access a short quiz at the link shown here. And this covers the basic components of a disaster plan. For more information about emergency preparedness, you can view the other training videos in this series or visit our resource library at the link on the screen. Thank you for watching.